Well, again, good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the book of Ezra. We're going to be in chapter 6 tonight, so Ezra chapter 6. And as you know or should know by now, the theme of the book of Ezra is the word of the Lord. Uh, God's word is mentioned 10 times in this book. There's only 10 chapters, so it's almost mentioned uh, once per chapter. So that's a, that's a key uh, part of the book of Ezra is God's word. The key verse is found in Ezra chapter 9, verse 4. And, and all of you know, right, that when anybody, any pastor says the key verse, it, there's nothing in your Bible that says this is the key verse. You know, we kind of look through it, we read the book, we study it, and we decide this, this verse kind of fits the, the theme of the book that was written, the reason why it was written. And so that's why we have a key verse. It's just to keep us on track with what the author intended for this book. So the key verse for me as I look at this is Ezra 9.4. It says, Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled. And so the people uh, had a holy fear for God's word. They had a reverence, you see, for God's word, a respect for God's word. And so when they heard the word of God, they, they got together uh, to hear it together in that sense. Now, while the book is called Ezra, Ezra doesn't even appear until chapter 7 of this book. The first six chapters are all about the return of the children of Israel from captivity under the leadership of a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And then almost 60 years pass before Ezra returns from Babylon. And, and during this time, between chapter 6, the end of this chapter that we're going to be in tonight, and the beginning of chapter 7 when Ezra returns, in that period of time sits the book of Esther. Uh, Queen Esther uh, and uh, Xerxes, the king of Persia, they kind of fit in that time frame. So if you wonder where the book of Esther fits, that's where it fits, between chapter 6 of Ezra and chapter 7 of of Ezra. Now in chapter 1 of this book we saw the proclamation, that is the decree of King Cyrus the Persian that allowed the Jews to return from their Babylonian captivity and begin to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. In chapter 2 we saw the restoration, that is the return of the Jews from 70 years of captivity. In all there were 49,000 897 people who returned from captivity with Zerubbabel. And, and this was a small portion of the whole. But what's interesting to me is that they left as slaves with nothing. Nothing. And they returned with silver and gold and livestock. God had taken care of them while they were in Babylon. In chapter 3, we saw the celebration. That is, they rebuilt the altar of God and they began to offer sacrifices again on the altar. And then they laid the foundation of the temple and then they had a, a great celebration of praise and thanksgiving. In chapter 4, we see opposition. Uh, God's work and God's people find opposition as they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And they became discouraged at that opposition. In fact, they stopped building on the temple and began to just work on their own homes and things. But in chapter 5, we had a declaration by the prophets, that is, Haggai and Zechariah, that directed and encouraged God's people to get back to work, to return to the work of rebuilding the temple. Sometimes we need a holy kick in the pants, amen? Mm -hmm. We get a little lax in our faith and in, in our walk, and we need a, a strong reminder from God. And that's what happened. Haggai and Zechariah gave the people uh, a strong encouragement and reminder to get back to the work that God had called them to. But as soon as that work had begun anew, opposition arose again from the Persian governor of the region, a man by the name of Tatani. And he sent a letter uh, that we have recorded for us in chapter 5. He sent a letter to the Persian king Darius, reporting to him that the Jews were rebuilding the temple. But that letter also contained the Jewish response uh, 
And they contended that King Cyrus, the former king, had indeed issued a decree allowing them to return and rebuild the temple. And, and by the way, if you read the book of Daniel, you'll find that it says there that no decree of a Persian king can be altered once given. So now in chapter 6 tonight, we're going to see a search of the royal archives that's made and we'll read King Darius' response to Governor Tatani. So if you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 6, starting in verses 1 and 2. Then, so the then is after this letter arrives from Tatani the governor. Then King Darius issued a decree and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon and at Akmetha in the palace that is in the province of Media a scroll was found and in it a record was written thus and we'll read that record in a moment so when King Darius received the letter from Governor Tantani he issued a decree that is he issued an order to search for the records that were referenced by the Jewish leaders, uh, 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 the records that supposedly King Cyrus had made. And after a search for those records, they were found at this place called Akmetha. It's also known uh, in history as Ekbatana, which is a, an ancient capital uh, city of the Medes. Now what Satan, no doubt, thought would hinder the work of God through this Persian governor, Tantani, only led to the work being completed and, as we're going to see that tonight, completed at the world's expense. You see, God truly is in complete control. Amen? God's in control. We read this in Romans 8, 28, a, a familiar scripture to you all, no doubt, it says there that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been called according to his purpose. And hopefully you love God. Amen. That's why you've come to him. And so all things, all things are going to work together for good in your life. The good things. Amen. Amen the bad things. Amen? Amen? Amen. They all things work together for good. And you know, I've described this before. And, and you know, our, our lives are, are a lot like a tapestry. But what we see on this side of eternity is the back side of the tapestry. We see a bunch of knots uh, and, and, and stuff but on the other side of eternity, when that tapestry is turned around, you'll see this beautiful picture that God was creating in your life. And, and so all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And God's purpose was to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the very temple that the Son of God would one day enter. And nothing Nothing they could do would thwart God's purpose and plan. What the enemy intended for evil, God, you see, used for good. And, and God's purpose today, by the way, is to prepare the world and his people for the setting up of his kingdom. But the present kingdoms of this world must first fall. And we are currently today watching this take place, watching this take form and shape. And nothing this world does will delay or thwart God's plan. Amen? Amen? Jesus Christ is returning. He will set up his kingdom. It will come. Surely it will come. And nothing will prevent it. Now look at verses 3 and 4. In the first year, and this is uh, the record that was written thus from the last verse. In the first year of King, Dar or King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. And here's the decree. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations of it be 
firmly laid, its height 60 cubits, and its width 60 cubits, with three rows of heavy stones and one row of new timber. Let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury. So this is the official record of uh, the decree of King Cyrus, which we, we read a copy of it also back in the first chapter of Ezra. It even specifies the dimensions. And, and how many of you know a cubit is like 18 inches? It's, it was a distance from the crook of a man's elbow uh, to the tip of his middle finger. That was a cubit, about 18 inches. So this building at 60 cubits high and 60 cubits wide is to be at least, if they built it this big, 90 feet tall and 90 feet wide. And it doesn't say how long it's going to be. Uh, likely, however, they didn't build it this big uh, as was evidenced from chapter 3, verse 12 of Ezra, where we read that the older men who had seen the first temple, when the foundations of this temple were laid, they wept because it just wasn't as great as the first temple. So it wasn't as big. Uh, likely, uh, this size, uh, 60 cubits by 60 cubits, were the allowed dimensions by King Cyrus. He said, build it this big, don't build it any bigger. He didn't want them building, I guess, a fortress. So he gave them the dimensions that they were allowed to build and, and likely they did not build it. Uh, now, however, if they did build it to these dimensions using just three rows of heavy stones, those would be massive stones. In fact, such stones were in fact, used to build this, the, the supporting Temple Mount. Lucy, if I can get you to flip the next slide real quick. Just flip to the next slide. I'll show you a picture of some of the supporting stones. I couldn't find the best pictures I had, but, but you can see how big. Here's a fella down here. And you can see how massive these stones are compared to this fella. These stones, by the way, were pushed off the Temple Mount. Remember, uh, they said that Jesus said that not one stone would be left upon another. And, and these are stones that were literally from the, the first temple pushed off the Temple Mount onto the pavement below. We had one photo. I couldn't find it for you tonight, but we had one photo. Uh, and you can back up a slide there, uh, back to the other slide. We had one photo where we stretched tip of our fingers to tip of our fingers like six or seven guys across a stone. That's how big it was. That stone was bigger than the width of this stage and taller than the height of this room. I mean, massive stones. So you can imagine three rows of heavy stones, how big these things would be. And how they moved these stones back in that day. I mean, I was just stacking firewood uh, and, and splitting some firewood, and I had to pick up a couple of rounds and, and they were heavy. And, and these guys moved stones that were, this, I mean, literally, some of these stones were half the size of this room this way and taller than this room. And they moved these stones and built with these stones. And, and they fit, like, tight together. You could barely get a piece of paper between them. So did the, the timbers, did they, were they upright in the middle? You know, I, I don't know if they, they were laid? upright. Somehow, one, uh, one commentator mentioned that they, they added the timbers uh, and probably crosswise across uh, for earthquakes, mm -hmm. you know, to, to support the building in that way. But I'm, I'm not sure of that. But, but anyway, they were massive, massive stones. Uh, now, here's the kick in the teeth for the opposition, though. The king's decree also said this. It said, let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury. So the taxes collected by the governor were to be used to fund the building of the temple. And, and this was a great victory for God's people. Uh, you know, it would be like the Supreme Court ruling that all Christian schools would have to be funded by the, the federal government. That's what it would be like. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Praise God. Now look at verse 5. 
Also, and this is also part of the decree, also let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and brought to Babylon, be restored and taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its place, and deposit them in the house of God. Now, these articles were given to a fellow by the name of Ashesh Bazar, whom he, that is Cyrus, made governor of the Jews who returned from the captivity. Since we also read that this man Zerubbabel was governor, we, we conclude, and, and, and that Zerubbabel laid the foundation, and that Shish Bazar laid the foundation of the temple, we conclude that these are one and the same man. One perhaps is his Persian name, and the other is his, his Jewish name, you see. And the fact that these treasures were no longer in Babylon or Persia, testified to the truth of the Jewish response to Tatnai and King Darius. The, 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 the treasures had already been moved. They were given to Shesh Bazar. He brought them uh, back to uh, Jerusalem for the temple service. Now we have uh, King Darius' instructions to Tatnai. Look at verses 6 and 7. Now, therefore... Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river. When it says beyond the river, it's talking about the Euphrates River. So everything west of the Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea. So Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Bosnai, and your companions, the Persians who are beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. That site would be the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That Temple Mount that still stands today. So this is a royal warning from King Darius to Tatanai and his associates to keep yourselves far from there. Wouldn't it be great if our elected officials stood up to support the work of God instead of trying to destroy it. Now, there are some, few, who do, but by and large, we are fast becoming an atheist nation. Did you know that? We are fast becoming an atheist nation. But I want to remind you again that God is preparing this world for the return of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom on earth. So, don't sweat it. Amen? Amen? God's got this. No matter what you read in the news, God has got this. God is in control. He's always in control. The world is not spinning out of control. Now look at verses 8 through 10. Moreover, this is King Darius continuing, speaking to Tatnai the governor. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews, for the building of this house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be, so, <laughs> so Tatnai, from your taxes, from your money, from your pocketbook. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. And whatever they need, young bulls, rams, and lambs for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, and wine, and oil according to the request of the priests who are in Jerusalem. Let it be given them day by day without fail that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Wow. Offer. Sacrifices of sweet aroma. Isn't that great? You know? Because those sacrifices point to Christ. And, and that's a sweet aroma to God. You know, Satan thought that through Tatnai, the governor, he thought he would hinder the work of God. But now this governor is ordered to pay for the work at the king's expense from the taxes beyond in the region, from those regional taxes. And again, this would be like federal tax dollars being used to build churches across America. Wouldn't that be great? And they also had to supply all the church supplies. <laughs> the animals, the salt, the wine, the oil, every day 
Every day they had to supply that. Can you imagine, after all the discouragement, all the opposition, what an encouragement this letter must have been to the Jews in that region. No doubt there was a lot of dancing and celebrating that night when this letter was read. Look now at verses 11 and 12. Also, so this is more from King Darius. Also, I issue a decree that whoever alters this edict, let a timber be pulled from his house and erected, and let him be hanged on it, and let his house be made a refuse heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or to destroy this house of God which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree, let it be done diligently. You know, King Darius didn't just issue a decree, but he put some teeth in it. When he says, uh, let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it, uh, this was an early form of crucifixion. Uh, the same form the Romans adopted from the Persians and then perfected. And it was no idle threat from this king. Uh, Darius was said to have put down a rebellion in Babylon by impaling 3,000 Babylonians in this way on wooden stakes. So this was a real possibility for anyone who alters this edict, including any king or people who put their hand to alter it or to destroy the house of God which is in Jerusalem. So in one sense, he put the fear of God in him. <laughs> then, verse 13, Tatnai, governor of the region beyond the river, Shethar Bosnai and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. I'll bet they did. <laughs> you give me a letter like this, I'm going to get right to it. Now look at verses 14 and 15. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edu. And they built and finished it, that is the temple, according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So it took the word of God by way of the prophets of God to get the work of God going and finished. Today, we need men of God. We need preachers who will speak forth the truth of God. Paul told the young pastor Titus, he said this, he said, preach the word, preach the word. The church needs the word of God more than anything else today. The anemic preaching of everything but God's word has weakened the church and it has emboldened Satan. So we need to get back to preaching and teaching God's word. Then God's people will rise up and do the work of God. Amen? Amen. That's how it works. It worked that way for the Jews and it works that way for us today as well. So after several decades, the temple was finally finished. There was discouragement. There was opposition. There was distraction. They were distracted by building their own homes. And, and we often find these same three roadblocks. And just like Israel, we need correction and direction by way of the Holy Spirit through God's Word. Amen? Amen. To get to the work that God has called us to. Now, three kings are mentioned here. If you're a good Bible student, you'll notice that. Cyrus, Darius, whom we've already seen and read about, and then a man by the name of Artaxerxes. Now, Artaxerxes had nothing to do with rebuilding the temple. He probably had much to do in seeing that King Darius' decree continued to be carried out, but he also plays a significant role in the Bible. 
Uh, we, we read about him in the book of Nehemiah. But it is his decree that we read about in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 25, a decree that was issued on March 14, 445 B.C. to rebuild Jerusalem. That decree set the prophetic clock in motion exactly 483 years or exactly 173,880 days from his decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, again, according to Daniel 9.25, on that day, 173,880 days, that is 483 years from that decree, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on the day we call Palm Sunday, April 6, 32 A.D., to present himself as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. This is why Artaxerxes is mentioned here. He is a link in the prophetic chain that God used, you see, to accomplish his purpose. We can all be links in the chain that God uses to accomplish his purpose today in this generation. Or we can be broken links. Don't be a broken link. Amen? Amen? Be ready to be used by God right where you are. And it may be like Queen Esther from the book of Esther. That you are where you are for such a time as this. Amen? For such a t- We, the church, are living in the final days Amen. of the church age. For such a time as this, you are living here today. Be willing to be used by God. It may be a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, a family member, that God will use you to reach for Christ. Amen? Be willing and available and ready to be used by God. Be a link in that prophetic chain and that purpose of God. Now look at verses 16 and 17. Then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. So the Jews celebrated the completion of the temple by making a great sacrifice. But this celebration was nothing like the dedication of the first temple. King Solomon offered 142,000 animals in sacrifice. Here we read that 712 animals were sacrificed. And, and it may be also that that was due to the, uh, the few people that, that came back. Uh, you didn't have all Israel to feed, as it were, with, because the people uh, ate of the sacrifice as well. So you didn't have uh, all Israel to feed, as it were. So it could be that those are some of the reasons that the sacrifice wasn't as great as in Solomon's day. I want you to also notice, however, that they offered as a sin offering for all Israel 12 male goats according to the numbers of the or number of the tribes of Israel. So all the tribes of Israel were represented. You see, there are not 10 lost tribes, right? All the tribes of Israel were accounted for. In verse 18, it says, They assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So with the temple rebuilt, the priests and the Levites once again begin to serve by their divisions. They were divided up into groups called divisions, and they rotated. Uh, They had shifts, as it were, and served at at the temple uh, providing the morning and evening sacrifices, uh, the feast, uh, special Sabbath services, etc. The only thing that's missing here that we don't read about is the Ark of the Covenant. 
We never read about the Ark of the Covenant again after the temple was destroyed uh, in Babylon or by the Babylonians. So we don't know if it still exists today at all. Some people think that it does. It'd be great if it does, but uh, those things have been fulfilled in Christ anyway. Amen? Now look at verses 19 through 21. And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. Then the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. So the temple, this temple, which the Son of God, God's Passover lamb, would come to, is rebuilt, and so the people begin to celebrate once again the Passover. They, in one sense, look forward to the coming Lamb of God by way of Passover. And we today look back to the Lamb of God who came. And we celebrate, by the way, elements, two elements of this Passover in our communion service. And we will uh, celebrate communion this coming Sunday. We look back and remember that Jesus was our Passover Lamb slain for our sins. So they, they once again celebrate Passover. And then they also celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These two have been pretty much combined by the Jews today. They're all celebrated during the same weekly festival. So look at verse 22. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is also celebrated along with Passover. Uh, in fact, leading up to Passover, all leaven, which is a symbol of sin, was removed from their homes and they only ate unleavened bread. And they celebrated this with joy because they recognized that the Lord had turned the heart of the king of of Assyria, which is another title for the king of Persia, toward them. So God had remembered them. God had not forgotten them. And as we look at the chaos in our nation and world today, we can also take comfort and courage that God's purpose will be accomplished no matter what the world and its leaders do. Amen? God will accomplish his purpose. Jesus Christ will come. The trumpet will sound. The voice of the archangel will shout. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And then it says this, Thus shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. So when Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom, guess who's coming back with him? Thus we will always be with the Lord. Wherever Jesus is, we will be. We're returning with Christ when he comes and sets up his kingdom. Amen? Amen. So the little book of Ezra proves that God's purposes will not be thwarted. He will accomplish his purpose. And by the way, he will accomplish his purpose and plan in your life as well. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. We'll have the worship team come back up for a final song. Father in heaven, we so, so thank you. And we so praise you. We realize, God, that, that even though it looks like things are chaotic in the world around us, we have a sure foundation in your word to stand upon. We know how it will all end. We know what you will do. And so we have faith and trust in you because of that. And so, Lord, because of these things, we don't fear, but we look forward with great anticipation to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 amen.